happen. Everything's fine. Well, I think we'll get started, y'all. Um, hang on for a second. I think everybody knows Jake Wells, but in case you don't, I'll tell you a little bit about him. And since they sent me his bio, I learned some things I didn't know. Um, they've been going, he and Lauren and their kids have been going to Trinity for 12 years. He's from um, Gastonia, North Carolina, where he was a regional pharmaceutical sales manager. And then he got transferred down here. Uh, so they, of course, moved to Blythewood. They've got two children, Parker and Lily. They both go to Cardinal Newman School. Um, they're doing fine. Lauren works at Blue Cross Blue Shield, but I've never asked Lauren what she does. What does she do, Jake? <laughs> a little bit of everything. Um, her, her, her background, she just started at Blue Cross about six months ago, but her background is communications um, and public relations. But she's a business partner with uh, Blue Cross now. So. Oh, wow. Well, uh, that's good to know. Um, mm. Y'all know Jake probably from any one of a number of different things he's done for the church. Um, I know him mostly as lay leader when I think Clark Cox was uh, church council chair, but he's also been the uh, finance chair and a Sunday school teacher of hill climber, not hill climber, hitchhikers. I'm sorry, where he taught for seven years. I think the most significant thing Jake has done for the church, I could be debated on this, but I think he formed he says he helped form, but I think he formed the vision team that uh, helped us establish a five-year plan. We're in year three of the five-year plan. Um, Jake did not have the vision, however, to predict COVID. And so, <laughs> kind of wanting in that respect. When he came down here, uh, he had to pick the Clemson Tigers or the Carolina Gamecocks, and he, of course, correctly picked the Carolina Gamecocks, and he, uh, he likes to cook. Barbecue is one of his specialties, and He'll be called upon before you know it to uh, lead a barbecue for us. Um, I Jake, Jake, good, good. Jake is one of the number one fans of Trinity United Methodist Church. We are all great fans of Jake's. I bet most of us are on here tonight because we know him and know what a great guy he is, what a great Sunday school teacher is. And we also know that he has a heck of a story to tell us. And I'm itching to hear it. I have not heard Jake's story. Some folks have sent me their stories ahead of time. I didn't get Jake, so I'm, I'm itching, itching, itching to hear what he has to say about his challenges. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jake. Go for it, or Tracy Barnes, whatever your name is. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. And um, I guess you can just categorize me as a suspense writer then, if, uh, since <laughs> I didn't give it to you beforehand. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's funny. The 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 um, you mentioned the vision um, plan. Now that um, Scott uh, is in place, now Pastor Scott. Um, some really great things are, are going to begin to happen even more when that with that vision plan moving forward. So um, stay uh, stay tuned. There's some great things that are coming. So and you're, you're exactly, let, let me interrupt. Yeah. I got to interrupt, Jake. Y'all don't know this, and it's not an official announcement, but Jake is going to be chair of church council next year. Did you know that, Jake? Did you know that? Know that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Anybody <laughs> else? We're so pumped about that. So now you may proceed, Jeff. Absolutely. No, no, wor no worries. Thank you so much. So Bob did allude to um, at the beginning when we moved to, um, to Blythewood um, 13 years ago, somebody told me, they said, what do you do on Saturdays? And I said, well, you know, just what the normal thing, um, you know, people do. And they're like, well, and I'm like, well, what do y'all do? And he said, well, we watch football. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. Lauren and I are both from North Carolina. So we're basketball people most, mostly. And um, so we never were huge football fans and we determined – when we looked around every Saturday and thought we don't have any friends because we're not able to do anything. We found out that people were all watching football. And so we had to immediately pick a team um, to follow so that we could have in a social life here um, when we, when we came. And so I did correctly pick the Gamecocks, although it has been a very, very tough decision over the years, I will say, but I love them. And um, it's, um, it's been a great joy of mine to, um, to, know so many of you and and to gain so many friends from um you. from the gamecock world as well and 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 cook I, I do i love to cook and that's my thing on saturday um anybody that wants to come the house is always yeah. open with something to eat so come on over um we'll first off i just wanted to say thank you for um for this opportunity and to tell my story i'm not sure you know what my story is um yeah i've been thinking about this now for over six weeks i guess and and i i guess everybody has a story um, and I, I wanted to do as much as I could to make it meaningful, um, not for just for me, but for you as well, and to, to get something out of it and hope that um, if there is something that, that you can take away from it, 
um, that we can get over the things that present themselves in our lives. So I, I grew up, um, went to church, was expected to go to church. Um, I guess, you know, thought I knew what a Christian was supposed to be. And um, when the church doors were open, we were there. My dad was very involved um, as a leader in the church. So I was exposed to it. I saw it. And it just was an expected thing, I guess, is that, um, you know, you just you just went to church. That was something that, that, was, that was supposed to happen. Um, I've always been a believer. Um, from, a, from an early age, I've always been a believer. And um, we've got a dog. Sounds like mine. Um, but I've always been a believer. And I, I thought I knew what, what that meant, I guess. I, I went through the most school and did the youth group everything. <laughs> no more. No more, Coco. Okay? You want to come here? Coco? You want to come here? Okay. Come in. Hop. Hop. Hey, Coco. <laughs> <laughs> um, Three dogs. Three dogs. <laughs> so, so I, like I said, I, I kind of just went through the motions. Um, and then when we moved to, to, to Blythewood, um, you know, it was, again, that was the first thing on our agenda was find a church. Um, and we found Trinity. Um, luckily we found Trinity and became involved with Trinity, loved Trinity, loved the people. There was, I think, I guess there was maybe always that little something that was missing. I don't know. Um, looking back on it, I can tell you for sure there was always that little something missing. It was just sort of going through the motions, like I've said numerous times, and it was just the practice of going to church, the, the ins and outs of, of doing those things. But in terms of strong um, spiritual life and prayer life, I know that I, I, I grew up with the Bible. I, you know, I, I, Scott said um, at one Sunday sermon, he said, I bet there's not one person out there who can stand up right now and say every single one of the books of the Bible. And after the service, I went up to him and I said, I can, I can absolutely do that. Um, but I, I just, there was always that little piece, though, that I felt like, you know, I, I don't have strong prayer life. I don't know what prayer is su really supposed to sound like. I, I don't know if I wake up in the morning with that purpose-driven sort of attitude that I, I need to serve God. Um, mm -hmm. That was missing um, in my life, looking back on it. I thought I was doing the right things. Then December 14th, 2014 hit. Um, I was, and, and as I tell this story, you, you will see that there are points that will demonstrate the title of this series is God is, God is good, right? And that what it is, God is great. You will see that there are points that will demonstrate just how good God is. And, and, and I'll, I'll try to point those things out to you. Um, I'm not a flashy guy in terms of like PowerPoints and all that stuff. So tonight we're just going to talk if that's okay. Um, because I, I just want to come from the heart and, and, and tell you, um, you know, about me and, and where I am and where my journey continues to go. So December 14th, 2014 hits, I was 42 years old. Um, living a great life, um, had a great job was uh, doing well, was actually rising through the ranks. I was kind of that next guy to be called up to the, to the next job. And, um, you know, it was, things were, were, were riding higher. Kids were doing great. Um, you know, we were, we were living the dream. We were living the absolute American dream. Um, and I had been having some symptoms um, for, um, I guess, what, about a year, maybe, Lauren? And Lauren's in the room with me. She's just off camera, but um, about a year maybe. And, and I, I, was, I was having symptoms and I was complaining and, and I was traveling a lot too, um, in and out of airports and airplanes, um, almost on a weekly basis, daily basis even. And I would find myself when I'd get back to my hotel room, I, I would get back to the hotel room. And again, I'm 42 years old, not an old guy. And I'd get back to the hotel and I'd just flop out on the bed, just absolutely exhausted and couldn't really move and wouldn't really move a lot until the next morning. 
and then I started developing and, and showing some, some other symptoms that were troubling. Now, here's where God stands and, and, and puts his, put, you know that God has put you in the right place, right? So this is my job. So I'm, I'm in pharmaceutical sales, have done it for 20 years. I was in the um, GI, gastroenterology marketplace, selling bowel preps for colonoscopies. I was managing a team that basically spread the entire Southeast coast up from DC to Florida, traveling all the time, in and out of GI offices, talking about colon cancer, talking about rectal cancer. Um, and I have to say that God knew what he was doing when he put that in front of me because I was having symptoms and Lauren was, of, of, like every man, American male, you know, I didn't want to go to the doctor. Um, I didn't want to uh, make a big deal out of anything. And we're all grown up people here. I told her, I said, you know what? I probably just have hemorrhoids. It's no big deal, right? <laughs> and I kept saying that and kept talking about it. And finally, she looked at me and she said, Jake, I love you, but I'm not going to talk to you about this anymore. We're going. And so December 14th hit, we go, we do our colonoscopy. I'm a pro at colonoscopies. I talk about them all the time, every day. I get paid. Um, that's how I make my money with people going and getting colonoscopies. Um, so I go to the doctor and he taps me on the shoulder as we're leaving. And this was before the colonoscopy, but he says, Jake, you're 42. It's a friend of mine. Jake, you're 42. You don't have anything to worry about, man. Don't worry about it. We'll get this colonoscopy taken care of and boom. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll be ready for Christmas and everything's going, going to be fine. So colonoscopy was scheduled for the 14th. I go in feeling great. My drug that I use, it worked. Everything was fine. Um, I go in and the next thing, those of you who have had a colonoscopy know kind of the, the, the way it goes. You go in, you take your, your medicine and you are out cold, right? And uh, then you wake up and it's all over. The minute that I woke up, um, even in my groggy state, I knew something was wrong. The first thing I asked my doctor was, though, is that I was trying to get his business. So I was like, uh, my, 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 my prep worked, right? I was really clean, right? And he was like, yeah, yeah, you're, you're clean. You're clean. But, you know, we need to, we need to talk. Mm -hmm. And um, that talk led to me being notified that I had stage 3C rectal cancer. I had a tumor probably the size of a tangerine um, that was not quite metastasized, but it was right there. It was very close. So stage 3C, one more step outside the cell wall and it would have been metastasized. Um, immediately the next day, I was sent over to get um, another um, biopsy, um, all kinds of ultrasound, um, all kinds of other tests and, and um, still having hope, right? Still having hope. They weren't really sure at the staging time at the, at the colonoscopy. I was like, well, how big is it? Where is it? And he's like, well, we don't know. We got to look at all that stuff. And so, um, so we did that. And, and then the, the word came a couple of days later that indeed it was um, pretty severe rectal cancer. Um, my world stopped. Uh, right there. Um, this was 10 days before Christmas. Um, the hardest day was um, when, when, when we did find the news, we, we, we got home and Lauren had to go run an errand or something. I, I can't remember. And I was home alone in the house by myself. And I started thinking, I probably need to pray, but I'm not sure exactly what I need to say. And I was in the house by myself and, and of course wept a little bit. And I called my, I called my mom and dad, told them, of course they were devastated. Um, and then the Lauren got home and we had a discussion about what we were going to do with the kids. And so we decided we were going to go ahead and tell them, be straight up with them. And that was probably the hardest thing in the world that, 
that I've ever had to do is as they walked in, Lauren looked at them and, and Parker at the time was 11, I guess. Um, Lauren looked at him and said, um, well, dad's sick. And Parker in his 11 year old wisdom immediately looks at me and says, it's cancer. <sighs> and I said, wow. Yeah. And so of course we hugged and did all that kind of good stuff. So, um, so the first step, the first step is, is that God stepped in, right? He put me in a place without me even really knowing or asking about it. God <laughs> delivered me to a place that allowed me to understand what my symptoms were. And I still waited too long, but he put me in a place that I was selling a something that, that was diagnosing the cancer that I had growing inside of me. I can't count that as a coincidence. I can't say that you can just chalk that up as chance. Um, I, I have to believe, and I do believe firmly, that that was, um, that was put in front of me for a reason. Um, the next six months were grueling. It was radiation 40 straight days every day. It was oral chemotherapy for months. Um, it was a struggle, um, you know, every day, um, to, there were nights when I would, and, and Clark Cox and, and Jeff Heath, two of my greatest friends in the world, I couldn't, I, 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 I they, they, they came over and put a chair in the, in the bedroom for me. So I could, I mean, it was just, everything was just, you know, everybody just stepped up and did such great things. But there were nights when I would sit in, in that chair and I think I, I'm not going to make it to tomorrow morning. I, I am, I am not going to live because the pain was there. The pain was so bad from the chemo and you, I know people have battled cancer before and, and, and those of you who have, God bless you. And that, you know, people that have, but the effects that chemo has on your body you know, just um, are amazing. One funny thing though, I have to say is after a treatment, Lauren had to go to the grocery store. So she came to pick me up. And um, I was craving lemonade. Don't know why, just craving lemonade. So we go to the store, we go to, we go to Kroger, and she's doing her thing. She's like, I just got to get a couple of things. And I said, all right, you go do your, your thing, get your couple of things. I'm going to go get some lemonade. And there was a certain brand of lemonade that I had seen, and it was in a big glass jug. And I, and I thought there will be nothing better than just sucking that whole jug of lemonade down after chemo. And so I went to get this lemonade and after I got it, I completely, what they call chemo brain. It's a real thing. It kicked in. I was completely lost, had no idea where I was. So here I am a 42 year old grown man walking through the store with this jug of lemonade but completely lost. And I felt like I've got, it was like, it's like a little kid when you lose your mom in the store. I was like, I've got to find my mom. I've got to find Lauren. <laughs> but uh, we found each other, of course. Um, but it was, it was a struggle. And, and so the, that part of it, we made it through and, and, and the radiation and the chemo really did do its job. It, it, it shrunk the, the, um, the tumor um, to where it could at least be operable at that point. Um, and, and I think that's where my life really changed because, um, I, I had at that point found out that my tumor was in such a place that, um, it definitely had to come out and it was going to leave lasting ramifications, uh, on me moving forward. Um, and the way, um, it affected my life. Um, because of where the tumor is, I was I actually went in surgery, went to surgery on April 15th on, on tax day. Um, and they, they removed the tumor, but while, when they did remove the tumor, they also had to completely remove uh, my entire rectum. So, um, I have, mm -hmm. uh, I, and, and will have for the rest of my life, a permanent colostomy bag. Um, and that, um, event um, has probably had the biggest impact on me because it, it completely, it completely changed my life. It, um, it, it turned everything around that I had planned really. Um, 
it, it made spontaneity tough. It made travel tough. It made, um, being in crowds, uh, tough. Um, <laughs> another funny story. Um, I was one of the first things that I was, that I went to was Parker's confirmation. I think it was a week after my, my surgery. And I was so worried. I don't know if you've had any experience with anybody that, that has a, a colostomy, but um, it, it, it can be noisy. Um, let's just say that it can, it can, it can be noisy and it can create some embarrassment. Um, and I was so nervous about going back to church for the first time a week after, I mean, this thing's brand new. Um, there's my dog. Um, I, 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 I was so nervous. And, um, I remember Parker looked at me and I, and, and I said, I'm, we were going to church and, and I looked at Lauren and I said, what happens if it like makes a noise, you know, and everybody in the church cracks up or whatever. And Parker again, in his 11, 12 year old wisdom looks at me and says, dad, if anybody laughs at you, I'm just going to punch them right in the nose. So, um, so that was when I was like, all right, I've got, you know, I've got team Jake here. Um, but I knew that that wasn't going to happen because I knew I was in a place where people loved me. Um, and, um, so I knew that that was certainly not going to, uh, not going to happen, but I, that was another little, little funny story out of the, out of the mouths of, of babes. Right. Um, and the, the interesting thing was, is that I, I, I was happy to be alive but I was not happy with my life. Does that, does that make sense? Has anybody ever felt like that before? You're grateful to be alive, but it kind of goes back to what um, Jenny was talking about last week when she asked us at the very beginning, where did you think you were going to be, you know, uh, when you were this, this age, you know, you're, you're like, well, I thought I was going to be this or that, but it, I was happy to be alive. I was happy to be alive for my children and my wife, but I wasn't, happy with the way I was going to have to live. And I put a smile on, um, I trudged through, um, I was grateful. The doctors were like, Hey man, you beat this thing. Everything's great. You know, life is perfect. And, and, and I kept on wanting to say, it's easy for you to say that you're not the one that has to live with the lasting ramifications of of what that, what life is and looks like for me now. Um, so I was mad and continued to be mad. Um, inwardly, I was very angry. Outwardly, I was not. Um, I, I leaned on my, my friends, um, and of course, Lauren and, and, and the kids, um, they were there when I rang the bell, you know, everybody's seen you when you ring the bell, when you're done with your chemotherapy. Um, and I'm grateful for that. I was grateful for that. Oh, then, but, but I, I didn't, I didn't like life. It had messed my life up completely messed my life up. So here I was now expected to travel airplanes. Think about getting on an airplane when you're not sure if something's going to happen. Um, so I would starve myself for days before I would get on an airplane because I was so afraid that I was going to have a bowel movement for goodness sakes. And I was a nervous wreck on airplanes. I was a nervous wreck at meetings. I was a nervous wreck in my offices. And the, so I, I began to resent that. I resented it so much. And then the thing that really had saved my life, the fact that I was in the gastroenterology world and I had a colonoscopy medication there, it actually made me resent it even more because it was in my face every single day. Mm -hmm. All I was talking about was cancer and, col and colonoscopies, and my living was dependent upon it, and I was mad. 
I hated it. I resented it. And it was just every single day, just bam, bam, bam in my face. And that lasted for four years. And in that four years, um, you know, I, I, I was angry um, because everything that I thought I was supposed to do, right, I had done. I never asked the question why, I don't think. Why me? I, I, don't, I don't think I ever asked that question. I think I more asked the question, why does that, I mean, why, why, why cancer? You know, I mean, why, why that? I mean, that would have been the one thing that I would just have not even, would have thought of. Um, but it did, nonetheless. Um, I was reading some, some things in preparation for this, of course, but also to, you know, I, I, I guess there was that sense of, and it, it's, this just pops into my head and, and, and Matthew, when, when you know, Jesus is on the cross and what even Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I think maybe that was what it, what it was for me. I, I don't, I don't know, but I felt like I had been not forsaken by God, but I just felt like I had been cheated. I, I don't know of a better word. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, you know, being you, you, people pat you on the back and they say, Hey, you beat this. And yeah, outwardly, I'm like, yeah, I, I did. But inwardly, I'm like, yeah, I beat it. But yeah, I beat it. But yeah, I beat it. But, and, that began to to really get me down because then then it was like all right i'm selfish now and i'm being selfish i lived you know i was near death and i lived um and just because you know you have a little lifestyle change you know jake you ought to you ought to be thankful for that um i wasn't i wasn't thankful for that fully um and so I, I continued to, um, to find myself in that entanglement, that entanglement of that I couldn't let go. I couldn't understand. It wasn't what I wanted. It wasn't what I planned. Um, I, I couldn't get out of my own way and I just was not going to accept it. And, and that's just sort of the way that it was. Mm -hmm. This is, this was how I was going to have to live. Jake, can I ask you something? Absolutely. Okay. I'm just curious, like, because it was stage 3C. Yeah. yeah. So what did they give you? Like, I mean, what were your chances? Or, or did they give you that? I didn't, I, I didn't want to interrupt, but. No, they never gave me chances. And please, y'all interrupt. I mean, anything. I, I, I don't want to make this just me blabbing. I mean, I think, I don't think I knew it was stage three. I yeah. don't, I, I'm, I'm sitting here in awe at everything you've gone mm -hmm. through. Well, thank you. you. Know? Um, but, but yeah, so they never gave us like a percentage or anything. I mean, they actually said you can beat it. Well. Yeah. They, did Lauren look it up? Yeah. Yeah. Of, uh, yeah. Of course. I mean, we, 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 we absolutely did. I mean, but yeah, they, they told us from the beginning that it was very, that it was curable. Okay. Um, but it was going to be tough. Yeah. Um, but if, 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 if left untreated for any amount of time whatsoever, it, it absolutely was, it was growing fast. It was, it was really, really aggressive. As a matter of fact, when the, when the, when the surgeon came in, um, after he had taken the tumor out, um, that's when actually it became the, that was the grimmest moment, most grim. I don't know. Anyway. Um, and, and because he, he, I never knew any of this, but he told Lauren immediately, he said, it, that's the nastiest looking thing I've ever seen in my life. It doesn't look good. It does not look good for your husband. And nobody ever told me that. And, um, until the pathology report came back and said it was completely cancer free at that point. No cancer and no cancer in the tumor um, at all. So 
And at that point, Jenny, the surgeon told me that I, the likelihood of his cancer coming back was less than me as a female getting breast cancer. Really? So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I almost feel like you need to do a testimony too, Lauren. <laughs> I'm going to shut up now. Sorry. Okay. Sure. Go back to where you were, Jake. I'm sorry. No, no, that's, no, that's perfectly fine. So, um, so yeah, no, I just, I, I just, the, the cancer part of it, I was very grateful for that. You know I mean? Like I was so thankful that, yeah, okay, I beat cancer, but I've got this bag now that sticks off my body and then my, you know, the vanity in you comes out. Right. I mean, it's like, all right, my clothes don't even look right on me anymore. I can't go to the swimming pool, you know, and, and take my shirt off anymore. I have not had my shirt off in public in five years. You know I mean? Like at a pool or anything like that, you know, it's in, or, you know, like I said, in airplanes, you're worried about, you know, having accidents and, you know, I did have an accident once um, in a bus in Miami. Um, I was with some colleagues going from the from the um, hotel to the airport, and I, I had a failure, and um, it was not. It was very bad. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm in a bus with people, and luckily, God is great. My best friend from work, David Watts, was sitting right next to me. He didn't miss a beat. This guy's the big Southern guy from, he lives in Dallas now, but he went to Ole Miss and, you know, just a great guy. And he was like, man, we got this buddy. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Help me clean up, you know, get, I mean, just, and, and once we got to the airport, you know, they, they all kind of gathered around me so that I wouldn't be seen by, you know, everybody. It was a mess. It was terrible. And, and that on my psyche was just, I was a nervous wreck 24 seven all the time. I was so afraid that something was going to happen. I had to plan for everything. And that was four years mm -hmm. that I went through that. But I go back to what I said earlier and that I wasn't accepting that this is how I was going to live. And that was the key word when mm -hmm. I finally decided that I needed to, to live. And that didn't come, um, until later and um, this is where God's faithful and again <laughs> I don't think that this was a this was a happenstance but we moved to Blythewood 13 years ago and our next door neighbors became our, our dear and, and fast friends Jennifer was a psychiatrist is a psychiatrist and at my deepest darkest point in my life where I just was not suicidal I was not suicidal but I was giving up I was I had I had separated myself really from God in a lot of ways I went through the motions probably none of you on here saw any of that or recognized any of that in me but I did you know I, I, I didn't that wasn't priority for me. It wasn't important to me anymore, um, even less than maybe it was before. Um, but yeah, you know, Bob, you mentioned Sunday school. Yeah, I continued to teach Sunday school. I continued to, but my life was just out of control. I mean, just I had no direction. I, 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 I didn't want to get up in the morning. I didn't want to go to work because all I had to face at work was colonoscopies and cancer. You know, I just, I resented it. I hated it. I hated every second of it. Um, and I finally called Jennifer Heath and said, I need help. I, I've got to do something. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm losing it. You know, I'm, I'm losing control of, of who I am and, and losing control of me. Now, who would have thought that 13 years ago I would move next door and the people who lived next door, one of them was a psychiatrist and became our best friends. So I had medication that saved my life from cancer. God put me in a place where I lived next door to a psychiatrist that was our dear friend and all I had to do was pick up the phone. And while everybody else probably had a four, five, maybe six week um, waiting period to get into some kind of mental health program, mm -hmm. boom, I was in there the next day the very next day. And I went through um, 
the program, it was, I was there for eight weeks um, during the day. Um, it was outpatient. So I would go in the morning, come home in the evening, in the afternoon. Um, and I can say that, that that probably was the thing that probably more than anything else really, really saved my life. Because then it gave me some direction. It gave me direction in terms of um, truly exploring where I was and why I felt the way that I felt. Why I was resentful, why I was hateful even at times. Um, and I started to reconnect. I started to reconnect with, um, the, by getting in the word. Um, I started to do daily devotions, which I had really never done in my life. I'll be honest with you. You know, it was, I'd do it for a week or two and then you, you know, you kind of drop off, but I, I, I would do it. I did it daily and continue to do it daily. Um, I had to come to terms with the L I V E part live. I got to live. I can't live the way that I was living because that was going to take me down a road that was just going to be completely awful and it would not have ended well. Um, but I knew that at that point I needed to start trusting in him and I needed to start trusting to look at his plan and not mine. Um, he had delivered me once again, he had given me another gift and God is the ultimate giver of gifts, right? I mean, we, we know that he is the ultimate giver of gifts. Every verse that you first learn in, in, in Sunday school is what John three sixteen. for God did what? So love the world. That he did what? Gave he his only son. He gave. He gave that gift, right? He gave that gift. And, and even as Jesus is up on the cross, he's saying, why have you forsaken me? And, he, and, and God is the one who gave that to us so that we, in our complete misgivings, torment, sin, peril, shame, whatever it is, we have been given that gift and are forgiven. Um, I was reading in Ephesians. I love, I like, I like Ephesians a lot. I, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's one of my, one of my favorite books. And um, Ephesians four, chapter four, verse seven says to each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned. I looked it up. The, the word gift or given talking about God in the Bible. I don't know how many there are, but there's tons. I mean, and, and, and when you start to examine and see just how good our God really is, how great our God really is, and what he, what he does for our lives with the gifts that he gives us, the places that he puts us. So one of the things that I said was how a cancer battle took me from complacency to growth. And inwardly, for me personally, that battle took me from complacency. I was a church goer. I gave on Sunday. I, you know, my kids were baptized, all that stuff. But I was complacent, right? I was, there wasn't a fire. There wasn't a spirit, really. Um, it was kind of corporate, for lack of a better word for me. You know, it was just kind of like, that's it's what, it's part of, it's part of what I have to do. Um, being a good, especially being a good Southern boy, right? It's just, you just go to church. <laughs> you just go to church. But that fire wasn't there. And then on top of that, I'm mad. Um, and I'm resentful. But that journey led me out of where I was from complacency to growth and into growth, not just me personally, that was the first step. But now I think moving forward, it's a fire about Trinity and what our role can be. And this is where I want some discussion too from you guys um, and your thoughts. Because going through my battle, um, and, and I will say this, the last part of my battle in terms of, of going through, um, the mental health aspect of things, um, that is something that I have not told until tonight. Mm -hmm. There were, um, 
couple of people who knew my wife, of course, my parents. And, and I, and I finally told Clark Cox on Sunday, we spent the afternoon Sunday and I finally told Clark then even, um, I, not because I was ashamed of it, of what, of what it is. I was ashamed of me. And I was ashamed that I was not more appreciative of the fact mm -hmm. that I am alive and that yes, it's a struggle and it's hard and it stinks, but I'm here, I'm alive mm -hmm. and I see my kids every day mm -hmm. and I get to experience that. And I want other people to experience that too. I want people to experience mm -hmm. that reformation, that growth, that, that fire that gets in your gut um, that wants you to do things for God, right? Do things for God. So God, you know, it, it talks about um, Matthew seven twenty one talks about surrendering to Jesus as Lord and giving Jesus control over our lives. Letting him take control of that part of it has been the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I felt like the weight of the, of the world had been lifted mm -hmm. off of my shoulders. Once I was able to just say, you know what, God, I just got to trust you and let you take it from here and, and, and not, not me. Uh, you know, I, I don't have the strength. I don't have the, I don't have the, the power. I don't have the know-how, the gumption, whatever it is you want to call it. I just got to turn that. I just got to turn it over to you. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's where, um, that's where I, that's where I was. And, and happily though, where I am now is much better place because I have turned it over. Um, I have given it back to him. Um, and you know what? I don't worry about things anymore. I really don't. I, I, I do, but I pray. I, and, and, and I, I, when I do worry, I pray. And I walk out mm -hmm. after that feeling like, all right, God's got this. We have to surrender, surrender to Jesus as Lord is giving Jesus control over our lives. Matthew 7, 21. That just hit me when I read that a um, couple of days ago, um, that that's what I did. Um, so that fervor, that fire, that, 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 that drive, um, now is, is what, um, I want to take, um, not I, I want to see, and I know all of you want to see Trinity go from that spot of what I would say complacency, probably, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. going through some motions and going and surrendering it and going from that complacency mm -hmm. to that fire. And it's nobody's fault that we have it. It's just we all, we all fall into it. But think about what this year has taught us. This year has taught us nothing more. If it's taught us nothing more is that everything is completely unpredictable. Mm -hmm. But it also has taught us that there are absolutely opportunities for new growth and mm -hmm. for new beginnings. And um, that's the fire that I really, really do have in, 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 in my gut for, for Trinity. Um, yeah, I was looking at some things about what it says about the church. Um, first Corinthians talks about, um, about fellowship and fellowshipping with Christ is that's, that's the church's distinctive mark. The church has the unity created by Christ through the spirit. And if I was to say, is there was anything that was lacking in my life, that was the, what it was. It was the S word, the spirit part of it, mm -hmm. right? The mechanics of it, they were all there. You know, all that stuff was there, I believed, you know, and, but the spirit part, you know, that, that just, that which gets you just, uh, you know, that touches that inner, most deepest, darkest place in your heart. And you just exude with joy, happiness, contentment, which is a word that, I learned um, that I was not good at. I was not content um, at all. Um, but I had lost, I had lost that spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, you know, I've jotted some things down, just what came out. This, the Holy Spirit can give us that nudge, that nudge that we need to do things that are not just the norms or going through the motions, but those things that truly touch the world and bring Christ to those who need him. And that's what I think Trinity can be and will be. And um, I, I just hope that 
we can regain that spirit as a congregation, not for us, but for all of the people out there who aren't there now. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. And Man, that, that's why I say, and that's why I titled this from growth, from complacency to growth, because my life was complacent. It took going to the deepest, darkest places in hell, probably, to recognize that I needed to grow. And I, I hope I have, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I, I stumble every day. I get mad every day when I have to deal with this or, you know, I have to, you know, deal with my, with my situation. You know, I get mad, you know, and, but I always now kind of just step back and go, you know what? You got this. Lord. One thing and I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll shut up and we can, we can, we can talk. But one of the things I, I, I did read this, um, this week as well. When we chase down every anxious feeling we have, its roots can be traced to our fear of the unknown, our fear of death, our fear of not being able to control other people and circumstances. God sent his son Jesus to enter humanity on a rescue mission. God is ultimately in control. And when we trust him, we have assurance beyond what we are facing. Christ's finished work on the cross is the answer to the soul ache for assurance, provision, and the protection we all so desperately want. We don't have to stand uncertain or anxious or fearful. Our rescue is certain whether we experience it here on earth or not. Our eternal home is prepared and will make all that we temporarily face during our lifetime pale in comparison. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. that doesn't take away the pain of what we face now, but it sure does help gain perspective that it won't always be this way. The greatest hell a human can experience here on earth is not suffering. It's feeling like the suffering is pointless and will never get any better. That's where I was. That's exactly where I was. We don't ever have to fear that because our rescue from all that causes us to weep will end. Revelation 21, four, how many times do you hear Revelation talked about? Not much, kind of scary, but anyway. <laughs> but talking about that causes us to weep will end. Revelation 21, four says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Um, That's all I got. <laughs> I know that was a lot. I, and I'm, I'm sorry I, I talked um, so much, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd love to hear what um, anything that, that, you know, we, we can pray about, talk about, whatever. So Bob, I don't know if you want, you want me to hand it over to you as sort of moderator or what, but. No, you, you moderate, but I will ask, you were just reading, was everything you just read out of Revelation or was it something and then you started reading out of Revelation? Yeah, no, it was it was just that final verse was out of Revelation. What was what was before then? Um, that was a study book. Um, the answers to your deepest longing longings. And who's the author there? It is. Um, it's Lisa Turkhurst. It's yeah. through um, Proverbs uh, Thirty One Ministry. It's her latest. Oh yes, yeah. It with her. It's really good. I've only just started it, but um, it has some really good things in it. The answers to your what? It's the answers to your deepest longings, 40 days through the Bible. Wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah, it's good. a great book. It has graphics and timelines and maps, and it's really neat. Wow. Pictures. Great. <laughs> yeah, we need, I need pictures. I need pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Jake, that was a very, very powerful testimony. I mean, you know, you just have such strength to have gone through what you've gone through and for you to share it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I, I mean, I'm not speaking for everybody. I probably could. It, it's just, you made us feel like what you were feeling and went through it. I, I just, I mean, what a powerful, strong message. Thank you. 
Thank you. Hey, guys, I totally respect your bravery in talking about this. Um, unbelievable. Um, I myself have, have a, I, I, I have had five colonoscopies and was diagnosed with lymphocytic colitis. And you probably deliver the drugs to my, <laughs> 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 to my drugstore that I use for my gastroenterology problem. Uh, and yes, I, 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 I have had my share of accidents and I totally understand where you were coming from uh, about not eating. I've, I've done that, not eating so that, so that I won't have a problem. I, there are some times when I have to wear an adult diaper when, when things aren't going in sync like they should be. But you have certainly enlightened me tonight to get back to listening to the Holy Spirit. You have, you have been, you have been a truly, truly good testimony tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you for allowing me. I agree. Get up. We knew, we knew yeah. that you had been sick, but we didn't know the whole scope exactly. the of everything. And okay. Stop. I just, I sit here in awe and think you were going through this, your family was going through this, and we as a church family really had, had about this much knowledge of what it was. And in part, it makes me feel very bad that yeah. we were not there for you. Mm -hmm. And that's, I guess, yeah, and that's you what you're saying in terms of the Holy Spirit, that, you know, if we need to capture that and so we can be more for and with people as they go through things. Yeah, like no, I, Trinity was uh, you, uh, Trinity was phenomenal um, to us. I, I, I kept a lot of this. Um, I, I, I wanted to keep a lot of this just <clears throat> with us. So, you know, I, I didn't. This is the first time I really told the full story, to be honest yeah. with you. I mean, I, I think it's really. Very and, powerful. Um, <sighs> so that was that was our that was my decision. I kind of wanted to. I, I'm just kind of that way. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm private when it comes to that kind of stuff. I'm not private. I'm, I'm very, you know, out front, but I'm, I'm private when it comes to those kinds of things. So no, I, I, I made the joke in church one time that it, my, my oncologist told me I was the fattest cancer patient he ever had because of all the food that Trinity gave us and the love that you guys showed us. So. Well, I, I'll say, I'd like to say that, um, you really helped me through, situation you probably don't even remember the brief conversation we had in the hallway at trinity but i do remember i i was facing surgery for what they thought was a tumor it was a tumor didn't know if it was cancer or not and um you know just your attitude and and that brief conversation changed my thinking about the whole thing thank, thank you. you that means a lot thank you so much pamela's got something hello Am I? You're yeah, on. I can hear you. Yeah. Well, my kudos are to Lauren. No doubt. Know, um, that has been your greatest advocate and uh, helpmate and all that. And I know you know that, Jay. Mm -hmm. But I also want to talk about this from a healthcare perspective. There are 4,500 people employed at Prisma Health. 4,500, that's as of two to three months ago. We've hired a lot more since then, but 4,500 people. The person who has most recently had a wing named after him, and I'm not going to violate HIPAA, but it went through the same thing you did. And you went through our hearts with that same trajectory of love and compassion and just wanting to know you and want you to know that we love you and we respond to you and we are behind you 100%. Jake Wells, you may not be on a, 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 you may not have a board named after you for Prisma, but you're our board member and we salute you. He's our wingman, right? Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, and, and trust me, I, I I I didn't do this for accolades. I really didn't. Um, but um, 
it means the absolute world to me. And, you know, I, I think that's part of why I'm, I'm so um, fired up. I, I just, we can do so much in this world. And when I say this world, we can do so much just in our little community here that is just absolutely amazing. And, and I just, I, I just, I just want to see it, you know, not for our benefit, but for the benefit of those who are, who are, who are yet to come. Mm -hmm. And, um, that, that's it. That, that's it. That's it. Well, I think I, rem I remember, Jay, you thought your spirit was gone, but to us, it wasn't. I remember when you were in your recovery, my dad had gone through some health issues and you'd always ask, how's your dad? How's your dad? So, you, you know, you, and like Kim said, you, you talked her through some things and your spirit was still in there. I just want you to know that it wasn't missing. It was trapped. It just, it just needed <laughs> to just come out. It, it might have been hiding a little bit, but I, I will always remember that as you were going through your struggles, you would always ask, how's your dad? How's your dad? And I appreciate that very much. So it was in there. It just needed a, a little push to get back out. Yeah. So thank, you. thank you so much. Jake, what you've shared tonight, I think it can be a real spark for us because this year has been like no other for any yeah. of us. Yeah. And I think what you, the resilience and, you know, turning the path and going a different way and having to do something differently is what we all need. We need to look at things different. We need to think out of the box. We can't do church the way that we used to do church. And I think that you've really kind of portrayed that tonight that, you know, we need to, to, to get on board and we need to, to let the Holy spirit guide us and do things. Yeah. Thank you. I agree. It's so cool that you agreed to do this and I didn't know what you were going to do. I figured it might involve telling some of your story, but good Lord, you sure have told your story. But when you agreed to tell your story, all you knew is that it was going to be Trinity. You know, you didn't know it was going to be these 26 people on the monitor screens. And you figured, well, I can trust. Yeah, I can trust those 26 people. You decided you can trust Trinity. And that's just wonderful that you feel that way about us. Mm -hmm. I do. I love you guys. I, I do. I love that place. And, and um, that's all I can say. I, I just I just want to see its best days ahead of it. Well, we love you too, Jake. And uh, we're so glad to have you in this church, man. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> hey, hey, Jake, this is Scott. Yeah. Hey, Scott. Yeah. I'm, I'm on the road, uh, but I'm listening in. And uh, I just wanted to say I, I uh, did not walk with you through your journey uh, before tonight. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it has brought a tear to my eye uh, and has actually mm -hmm. encouraged me. Because uh, you, everybody on this call knows that uh, I know Trinity's best days are ahead. And I, I think that it, it, the resilience that, that Jake and Jenny and Mike and Lynn have done these couple of weeks is, is a testimony to who Trinity is and who we're going to be and who we're going to be even better than where we are. And that, that though there are roadblocks in our way, um, you know, nothing's going to stop us. And um, I appreciate you uh, carrying that torch. We're going we're to need all of us to do that. Um, and uh, I really do appreciate Lauren uh, as a caregiver. Um, if anybody has ever had been a caregiver in that way, um, it, it takes a lot of work. Uh, and um, I think now is our opportunity to uh, take back Trinity and take back Blythewood and say, okay, the, the roadblocks of 2020, we can throw out the window right now because we're going to bust right through them and, and head on out of here and really, really do something. The spirit is going to, going to overtake us. So uh, we're going to need your help, Jake, and everybody else on the call and uh, to, to, to keep pushing us forward. Absolutely. Thanks, Scott. Buckle up, everybody. It's going to be a ride. Right. <laughs> Hope you like roller Jake. coasters. Jake. So fun. Yeah. Is Parker really driving? Have I gotten that old? <laughs> Parker, Parker, Parker graduating from high school this year. Oh, my uh, goodness. Oh, my gosh. I believe it. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's a senior. 
No, 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 no. That's not real. That's, That's real. Crazy. Don't take news, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? That was true. <laughs> So where, is he, where is he thinking of heading to college? <laughs> well, uh, South Carolina. Yeah. 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 So. Okay, so nobody else wants to say this, but I'm going to say it. Lauren, uh, Jake, when you have your glasses on, yeah. you look like a young Kiefer Sutherland. <laughs> Not just me. <laughs> Who else? That is so funny. I'm just no. saying. You're not the first person who's told me that. You're not okay, the first see? Right. Told me that. Lauren's married what to Kiefer. That's your new name. That is so funny. <laughs> I've never heard that. Telling you, or maybe it's through Zoom. I don't know. You know, but uh, my barber, uh, my barber uh, back in Gastonia, he he told me that one time. He's like, you know, you look just like Kiefer Sutherland. I'm like, yeah, oh, seriously, seriously. <laughs> Hollywood, here comes Jake. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Thank y'all. Thank you so much, guys. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Wonderful. Well, real, thank real, you, real Jake. Up. And Scott, I'm giving you a, a one-minute warning that you're up for a prayer, man. But, um, Sounds good. It's been a great series. Thanks so much to Lynn Grimes for coming up with the idea. And I want oh. all four of you presenters, I don't see Michael, but all four of you presenters to know that you are our first choice. Every single one of you said, I'll be glad to do it. I will do it. And we're so grateful for that. And these have been spectacular programs. <clears throat> Lynn, talking about life as a marathon. Hold it, I'm getting interrupted. No, nope, you're not. <laughs> Lynn, talking about life as a marathon and the Boston Marathon bombing. Michael, talking about how life is a journey with the ups and downs and the sideways and the ultimate upward um, slope. And then Jenny, talking about, I, I defined it as we're not allowed to choose our lives, and that's a good thing. That might be a decent way to describe what Jenny just, uh, talked about last week. And then Jake talking about from complacency to growth. All of these have in common the fact that God is great, but all of them having these personal life stories, every single one of them. And uh, it, it shows that people are willing to, to talk to, to Trinity and, and tell their very personal stories to Trinity. And it means that Trinity is um, the kind of place where, fe where people feel safe telling these personal stories. And we hope more and more people will do things like this uh, if we, uh, as we do more of these, and I hope we will do more of these uh, next year or in the future. And um, you know, Bob, everybody has a story. Amen. Everybody yes. has their own story. You're right, Lynn. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And, they're, they're and all, I think we all benefit by hearing each other's stories. Mm -hmm. Relate to them. Relate to them. <clears throat> Scott, could you close us in prayer, man? I certainly will. All right, well, let us pray. Oh, good and gracious God, we are thankful for this day. We are thankful that we've been able to live in it, use the gifts and graces that you have given us, and that we pray that we have served you well. We are thankful for tonight, and we lift up Jake Wells, his testimony that he shared with us tonight, powerful, one that we can hold on to, but God, we don't give Jake the credit or the glory. We give you, oh God, the credit and the glory. Mm -hmm. For it is easy for us to look at the, the, the roadblocks, the hazards in our way and say, why? But you say, why not me? That we go through and around the corner, mm -hmm. you're there with a blessing each and every time. We're thankful for this series. To We already knew that you were a great God, but... Lynn and Mike and Jenny and Jake have walked and told their story. And God, as it has been said, we all have our story. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long is how we should live each and every moment. God, just, just take us into the, the rest of this evening and tomorrow and allow us to, 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 to live a life that you're calling us to live. We th certainly thank you for this night and everybody on the call. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.